Isn't it peculiar what tricks of light and shadow can do? When we took another picture a few hours later, it all went away. It was just a trick, just the way the light fell on it. And that was the first lie that NASA told us about the face on Mars. The first amongst many. Welcome back. We are rebooting history. Today we're talking about the monuments, the face, the structures on Mars. I'm lying those about Mars. And NASA's cover-ups, lies, deceptions. We are going to demonstrate that there was life on Mars and that there's probably life on Mars right now. So, buckle up. Let's give them the boot. Let's reboot history. Isn't it peculiar what tricks of light and shadow can do? When we took another picture a few hours later, it all went away. It was just a trick, just the way the light fell on it. For a biologist, one of the great scientific opportunities of our time is the search for life on Mars. This is Gerald Soffin the man who made the statement that it was all a trick of light. The face on Mars disappeared after a second picture was taken a few hours later. It was all a trick of light. The problem with this statement is there was never a second picture taken a few hours later. And that would have been impossible by the way because the first picture was taken 35A72 late in the summer Martian day at about six o'clock two hours later would have made it dark and a picture would have been impossible so Gerald Soffin effectively lied in front of a hotel room full of press and scientists and put the whole matter to bed about this face in the region of Cydonia of Mars in 1976 I want to examine how this came to be to this moment in history where he had to lie. So let's start at the beginning. When Mars was being examined by Mariner 9 in 1971, scientists realized that the southern portions of Mars was, was crater field and the northern portions of Mars and the northern hemisphere were a lot different and it looked like there was more water there and open areas, probably better for exploration. So they then decided to put some kind of a lander in Mars's northern hemisphere. Fast forward to 1976, when the Viking missions were taking place, they decided to, again, take pictures of the northern part of Mars and try to select landing spots for Viking 1 and Viking 2's landers. Viking 1's landing site was in a region called Kreis Planitia. And Viking 1 sat down at that spot, landed on the Martian surface on July 20th, 1976. Now the time had come to look for a place for Viking 2 to land in Cydonia. And this is the point where Toby Owen was searching for a landing spot for Viking 2 in the region of Cydonia with his magnifying glass. And he saw this. His first words were, Oh my God, look at this. And after a few moments, Gee whiz, isn't that weird? And NASA was trying to drum up some publicity so they mentioned about this face. But later on they had to cool it off because it went viral in a way and there was a lot of press about it and people wanted to know about this anomaly. So that's when Gerald Soffin made that statement that it was all a trick of light. The face on Mars became an afterthought and what happened next? Did they go ahead and land Viking 2? in the region of Cydonia as planned? No. They changed their plans, said it was too rocky there, and landed Viking 2 
a half a planet away in a region called Utopia Planetia, in a very rocky area. Some scientists complained that it wasn't a very attractive site, kind of like landing in the middle of a crater. But that pesky Mars, that pesky Mars ended up proving once they got some samples from the Viking 1 lander and Viking 2 lander that there was life on Mars. Which NASA then swiftly corrected to no life on Mars. We're going to look back at this a little bit more later, but for now, let's move on to the rest of the story about the face. So now three years have passed. There were two people at that infamous Gerald Soffen press conference. Their names were Vincent DiPietro and Gregory Molnar. They were computer imaging experts and they happened to be talking about the face on Mars and hadn't forgot about it. And they later on, they dug through some NASA files which were misfiled for that day, July 25th, 1976, summer of, and they realized that there wasn't a second picture taken. A few hours later, like Gerald Soffen had said, but there was a second picture taken of the anomaly, the face, and that happened 35 days later. And that is the picture we know today as 70A13 at a different time of day with a different lighting. And it showed that something was there that looked anomalous on the Martian surface in the region of Cydonia. And there was two different pictures to prove it. So it was in about 1980s and the early 80s. We had Molinar and we had DiPietro. And they kind of needed some help. So they ended up recruiting Richard Hoagland. Richard Hoagland is a scientist that works for NASA, that worked for NASA at the time. He helped develop the Voyager probe that went out into space, the message. He actually made that message and helped put, put that message together. He was also at the Gerald Soffen press conference in 1976. He got involved with, with the face on Mars and he was, he was attracted to it. He became captivated by it. And he is a big reason why we even have, we even know about Mars, the face on Mars, anomalies of Mars today. He appeared on Larry King Live in the 80s with a picture of the face on Mars. He appeared on Art Bell and kept drumming up support for the, to have the face looked at. He defeated Steven Squires, a NASA scientist, in a debate on CBS Nightwatch in 1988, where it was finally learned that Steven Squires had, had never even looked at a picture of Cydonia. Then the time came in 1993 where NASA was going back to Mars with the Mars the Mars Global Observer. One problem, the satellite didn't have a camera on it. So Richard Hoagland went out of his way to try to get a camera on that global orbiter to take some pictures of Cydonia. So NASA finally succumbed to the public pressure, put a camera on the Global Orbiter. The camera was made by Michael C. Malin. Michael C. Malin. He ended up getting all the rights to the camera and he could control all the pictures of the camera. So there would be no live photographs of Cydonia coming from Mars. Michael Malin made it so there would have to be a a month wait period, a six months period wait before any photographs would be revealed to the public because he owned the camera and his, and his company did. And, and NASA was trying to have contracts with these private contractors. So they, they gave him all the rights to the, to, to, the, to the film. Orbital camera. In an unprecedented move, NASA had decided to sell the rights to all of the data collected by the observer to Malin himself in an exclusive arrangement. 
that gave Malin godlike powers over when or even if he decided to release any data the camera collected. Next thing we have to do is try to get that camera into space. Turns out there was trash on the on the camera. In late 1992, during a routine inspection of the spacecraft on the launch pad, NASA technicians discovered severe contamination inexplicably inside the protective shroud consisting of metal filings, paint chips, and assorted trash. According to Mars Observer Project David Evans, during the inspection process, NASA discovered the presence of an unspecified foreign substance inside the spacecraft's Malin's camera assembly that would have made the resultant images blurred and virtually worthless for resolving the Cydonia issue. So yeah, they had a little problem with Vaseline on the um, camera lens. Next, Malin was giving Hoagland a hard time about how many times that they could take a picture of the face on Mars in the region of Cydonia. Hoagland and Dr. Stanley McDaniel began to dig into Malin's contentions and quickly discovered that Malin's claim of at best one or two opportunities to target the face was greatly understated. After consulting with mission planners at JPL and reviewing the technical specs, they found that there would be more on the order of 40 plus chances to target the face during the regular two year science phase. So why did Dr. Malin, if he was honest, underestimate the image opportunities by a factor of 20? Hoagland and McDaniel smelt a rat. So after the Mars Observer launched, it went missing for 85 minutes. Then it reappeared suddenly. And when, and when they looked back at the information, it was gone, it wasn't there. But then a few days later, the information was there suddenly. So it looked as if it had been tampered with. How did the data from the missing time episode suddenly find its way onto a tape that had been blank only days before? It was as if someone had erased the actual recording, then subsequently uploaded a manufactured nominal data stream a few days later. The Deep Space Network engineers were insistent that they hadn't simply missed something, uh, missed something the first time around. There was no data on the tape the first two times, JPL's Deep Space Network manager angrily declared. The news media of course had little knowledge of or understanding of how impossible the whole situation was and quickly dropped the issue. It did however become considerably more relevant 11 months later. Even after the launch, NASA maintained that they had no interest in photographing the face or Cydonia. The debate went back and forth until about three days before Mars Observer was inserted into Mars orbit. NASA sent out the Mars Observer lead project scientist, Dr. Bevan French, to debate Hoagland on Good Morning America. Now to put it gently, it did not go well for Dr. French or NASA. We now have a set of data so extraordinary that it demands in the venue of any decent science simply testing the hypothesis. The problem is that there are some folks in NASA in charge of the next mission going back, specifically that camera I referred to, who seem less than overwhelmingly inclined to perform the simple test. They will not guarantee, strange as it may seem, that taking new pictures is on the Mars Observer agenda. By the end of the debate, even the host was asking NASA, why don't you just take the pictures and prove these guys wrong? Dr. French didn't have a good answer for that. But what happened next was even more suspicious. Less than five minutes after the debate aired, NASA made an announcement. The Mars Observer probe had disappeared. They'd lost all contact with it. <laughs> and here's an interesting side note. Hoagland and others claimed they were getting leaked information from NASA insiders. According to the leakers, the Mars Observer was still out there and running just fine. In fact, it was taking pictures of the face and all kinds of other weird objects on Mars. But even if NASA had those pictures, they couldn't show them publicly, especially if they showed the face was an artificial construction. NASA continued to claim that the face was nothing more than a pile of rocks. It was this time in between 1993 and 1998 that I became aware of the face on Mars and began to be interested in it. 
because I saw a demonstration by Richard Hoagland and after watching his presentation about the face on Mars I became interested fast forward to 1998 and NASA was going back to Cydonia five years later after the observer disaster or the observer lies all in all it was 22 years later they go back to Mars they go back to Cydonia with a new mission called the Mars Global Surveyor even though there were new, newer cameras available NASA wanted to go with the older cameras again they were reluctant to to take pictures of the region of Cydonia and again it was public pressure by Richard Hoagland that made them take pictures of Cydonia so on April 5th 1998 NASA took a picture of the face on Mars they released it to the press and all of the press around the world ran this picture of the face on Mars along with its information that it was nothing but a mesa of Mars a pile of rocks a common pile of rocks a common butte of Mars as can be seen fortuitously the area imaged was relatively clear although the lack of surface definition in many nearby areas and the low contrast of the raw MOC high resolution image suggests haze or fog over much of the area NASA's chief scientist James Garvin had this to say about the face on Mars sadly the picture has got nothing to do with alien life rather it's the Martian equivalent of a butte or a mesa which are common landforms around the west of America sorry guys it reminds me most of Middle Butte in the Snake River Plain of Idaho Garvin said that's a lava dome that takes the form of an isolated mesa about the same height as the face on Mars so now once again the face was relegated to an afterthought by the world media the first time in 1976 it was just a trick of light and now it was just a common mesa or a butte on Mars but was it really was that all it really was back then after studying both pictures from 1976 and 1998 the first thing that I noticed was was the crater in the lower left hand side of the picture was changed it was different it was no longer round but it was oblong this to me said that the picture had been stretched the picture had been skewed look at the difference in the crater from the picture of 1976 to the picture of 1998 they basically murdered they murdered the little crater look at the little crater the picture was so bad that it got titled the cat box picture by Art Bell because Art Bell thought it looked like something that would, would be in his cat box that we find in this cat box and it was found later that the picture had been manipulated by some kind of Photoshop at least 14 times PPL removed most of the tonal variation in the original image that gives the observer the visual cues to the real three-dimensional shape of the object they added false visual cues to give the object its rough jumbled appearance inadvertently falsifying the appearance of the surrounding terrain as well the tap box is not a poor enhancement as it is often called it is a crude but very effective fraud perpetrated by employees or contractors to the United States government even if the face is proven to be completely natural this is inexcusable misconduct and a gross abuse of power if the face ultimately is proven to be artificial the cat box will certainly come to be regarded as the greatest most malicious and most destructive scientific hoax of all time that along with the fact that the pictures of Mars in the 1990s were always covered in this red hue again it was photoshopped the red hue was made to make the planet looked like it had red skies and that was just an effect of basically like a Photoshop effect when the skies of Mars were actually blue 
here we can see how if you just make an uh, adjustment with the lights with the color of the, of the of the pictures of Mars you can see that the, the sky is actually blue so what this is all telling us is that NASA didn't want us to be at Mars NASA didn't want us to go to Mars they didn't want us to see what was at they, they didn't want us to see what was on Mars they didn't want to make it any more Earth-like NASA doesn't want the public to know about Mars. Why? Because there is life on Mars, and their own test revealed it. Dr. Gil Levin developed a test for NASA that they used in 1976, which found life on two different sites on Mars. The businessman, the war hero, the scientist. In 1967, Dr. Levin founded Biospherics Research, Inc., where he invented low-calorie sweeteners, safe for human pesticides, and much more. Gilbert's ability to find microbial life was so publicized that NASA awarded him a series of contracts to develop methods of detecting extraterrestrial life. And I developed an experiment that, yes, went to Mars on the Viking mission to Mars, and it did get a positive signal, which I claim was evidence of microorganisms in the soil of Mars, but since now it was over 40 years ago, nobody wants to cozy up to that idea. So what I'd like best is to finally have it acknowledged that this experiment detected life on Mars. How can the planet Mars have life? For epochs of time, the red planet Mars was water filled, covered with blue seas. The average depth of the oceans was approximately the depth of the Mediterranean Sea on Earth. Mars is in fact an incredibly Earth-like planet. It has almost the same shape as Earth, and it is tilted in the same way which gives Mars its four seasons. The length of a day on Mars is just over 24 hours, and Mars has the gravity one-third of the Earth. So if you weigh 240 pounds on Earth, you would weigh 80 pounds on Mars. Must be nice. Mars has the largest volcano in the universe. Mars has the largest volcano in the solar system, Olympus Mons. And Valles Marineris is a gorge in the planet's crust that dwarfs the Grand Canyon on Earth. Mars also has polar ice caps. If you think in galactic terms, the planet Mars is incredibly close to the planet Earth when the orbits of both planets sync up. You could reach the red planet with rocket power, a technology that mankind developed in World War II. It is and was a marvelous, beautiful planet. Even today, the average temperature of Mars at the equator is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Imagine Mars with its oceans and an uncompromised atmosphere. The deep seas of Valles Marineris filling up the huge trench the side of Mars is two moons casting shadows over the planet as they orbited over. All these reasons are why Mars had life. If you look at where Dr. Levin's samples were gathered, one from Viking 1's lander in Christ Planetia and the other in Vikings 2 lander in Utopia Planetia, we could see how both landers found biological life as both samples were taken from what was once Martian seabeds. My guess is the water table is pretty close near under the soil. Was there an ocean on Mars? This color image was created from the Nadir channel oriented perpendicular to the surface of Mars and the color channels of the HRSC. It shows a network of huge fractures in Utopia Planetia. New research results link the formation of these huge polygons in this region to the previous existence of an ocean in the Martian northern lowlands. These kind of fractures remind me of dry lake beds on Earth. This is why I think that there was oceans there. This is why I think the water level below these fractures possibly is not that far down. And these fractures are a clue. I have a surprise for you about these fractures when we start looking at 
the structures of Mars, the monuments of Mars. And that's going to be our next topic. So buckle up, because I have some surprising information about Cydonia that I don't think many people talk about. But first, let's talk about this monolith. Visit the moon of Mars. There's a monolith there, a very unusual structure on this little potato-shaped object that, that goes around Mars once in seven hours. When people find out about that, they're going to say, who put that there? Who put that there? Well, uh, the universe put it there. If you choose, God put it there. Is it I want to show you guys how to find Cydonia. So first of all, we're going to spin the planet around and it's in Arabia Terra. We're going to start zooming down the northern hemisphere and first thing you're going to look for is the coffin. Once you find the coffin, you're going to go up from there a little bit and you're going to go to the bear paw. The bear paw with three little toes and the toe to the left, you want to go up from the left toe, the far left toe, to go towards the squid. Once you have found the squid, then you have found Cydonia. It's the top of the squid. You'll see these two eyes on the squid. Now north of there, you're going to find the city of Cydonia. This is where the face of Mars is and all the monuments of Mars in the region of Cydonia. There's the face, can you see it? Let me help you. We call this the arrow. It's kind of shaped like an arrow pointing down and that's pointing kind of right to where the face is. And then this is Cydonia. So let's take a better look at this place. Let's get a zoom in. Let's, let's, take, let's take it off the NASA, NASA blurry picture. Let's take it off their just take it off the classic NASA blurry and spring it in a little tighter. So here we are. This is the face. This picture has actually been, in my opinion, photoshopped by NASA too. Kind of give it like a mucky, flooded feel, like a deep mud feel. But we're going to fix that later on. I'll show you some more the correct pictures. But this is the face and this is the city of Mars. So let's learn a little bit about this, uh, this area. At about 40 degree north latitude, and on the other side of the planet from Elysium, the pyramids of Cydonia were photographed in 1976 by the Viking One probe from a height of about 1600 kilometers. Many elements that are of artificial origin can be seen in the picture. The most amazing is an enormous face, which resembles the features of the earthly Great Sphinx. Thanks to the second photograph taken 35 Martian days later, under different lighting conditions, another image was discovered. It made it possible to conduct a comparative analysis and accurate measurements of the face. Approximately 16 kilometers away from the face, there is a five-sided DNM pyramid named after NASA employees Vincent DePietro and Gregory Molinar, who discovered it. Like the Great Pyramid in Egypt, it is oriented almost exactly to the north-south axis. The facade of the DNM pyramid has three sides, located at an angle of 60 degrees. The central axis points to the face. The image of the pyramid to the left of this axis points to the center of what the researchers of Cydonia called the city. The edge of the pyramid to the right of the central axis points to the top of the dome structure, exactly called the dome. Having discovered the pentagonal pyramid, DePietro and Molinar noted its size, 1.6 kilometers by 2.6 kilometers. These numbers are very close to the golden ratio. Richard Hoagland, a former NASA consultant, looking at the perfect pentahedral mirror symmetry of the DNM pyramid, notes, if you overlay the famous figure of Leonardo da Vinci, the Vitruvian man, on the perfect geometric shape of the DNM pyramid, they will match. DNM seems to be a striking statement of human-like proportions, built on alien terrain, almost in the shadow of the main humanoid resemblance of the face. The face is not a single structure on the Cydonia plane, but it is surrounded by other abnormal structures, which some researchers consider to be even more important. Hoagland drew a horizontal line at right angles from the vertical axes of the face structure. It led him to the center of four small cross-shaped mounds and a small central mound. 
which itself seemed to be the center of a group of 10 geometric pyramidal shapes. He called this collection of landscape elements the city and gave it the following description. The rectangular construction of massive structures is alternated by several pyramids of smaller size and small buildings of conical shape. All this is located on an area of 4 to 8 kilometers and follows a rectangular layout created by numerous elements located at right angles to one another, including even straight streets going approximately from north to south. So I want to talk about my favorite picture of Cydonia. I probably have spent hundreds if not thousands of hours looking at this picture. This picture is 35A72. This is the best picture of Cydonia I think there is and the most famous. This is what Gregory Molinar and Vincent de Petrio, when they looked at this picture they thought oh we need to start looking for pictures in NASA's archives because this just looks too incredible. First of all we have the face. To give you an idea of scale the face is 1.5 miles long by one mile wide. If you look at the nose you'll see this little dot it looks like a nostril but it's not a nostril it's just the artifacts on the picture itself you can see all those there's lots of dots everywhere but it kind of looks it made it look like there was a nostril on the face it made it look like too much like a human face so people are like that can't be real but that nostril is not really there it's just an artifact of the picture so it's just a dot it just happened to line up to where a nostril would be let's look at the shadow of the face the shadow kind of looks like a rounded triangular shape so it's like a soft triangle so I'm thinking there is a little bit of a kind of like a rooftop shape to the to the face which kind of looks like some kind of a primate face if you look at the picture without the nostril it looks like a primate kind of shape a primate kind of monkey face to me now let's look at the let's look over here at what they call the city first of all I noticed this impact I see this round circle here it looks to me like something hit here. Not really like a crater, but there's some kind of an impact, a circle. I don't know what that is, but it looks to me like some kind of an impact. This impact may have damaged what appears to be structures to the upper left of the circle. And that structure is known as the fortress. And to me, it looks like this wall might have been broken, busted inward, now at a right angle connected to the broken wall, we have this other wall that has these little circles on it. These fine little details in this picture, and only in this picture. You see these little circles? If you're wondering what this thing is here, I'm pretty sure this is an artifact that's on the picture. It's just an artifact, like the dots. But overall on this picture, you don't see any kind of detail like this in Cydonia after this picture. Once they realize, they go, oh God, we can't be showing this stuff because there's just too much detail. Every picture after that, the cameras were supposed to be way better in technology, but no, they're not as detailed. Or either that, they have been photoshopped. They like totally muck these pictures up, but this is the original pictures. All the newer pictures of Cydonia to me are trash, pretty much. This is the picture you need to be looking at. Now let's go up here to the, above the fortress, you'll see these squares, like these right angles right here this to me like a big foundation is huge it's, it's football fields long by football fields across and there's two of them right here we can kind of get a general impression of this other one right here but and it's, it's lined up with this what like a city block okay it's like a city block it's squared all these things kind of line up and they also kind of line up to the face now this is a very important feature, these, these squares, this, the, again, the detail. You don't see these things very often, only in this picture, but you can clearly see there is some kind of square there, very important. This, to me, tells, says that this is once, there's structures here that are lined up and built in a, in a formation. Now, let's move to the left of the fortress, and what you'll see is what looks to be like a pyramid, a pyramid-shaped structure. I wonder if it's a pyramid shape. Well, look, look at the shadow. It's, it comes up to a fine point and we look at these angles. Let's compare these angles to the pyramids on the Giza Plateau. This is a pyramid of the Giza Plateau and this is what appears to be a pyramid in the region of Cydonia on Mars. 
How often in nature and mountains do we see a pyramid shape that's just that pointed in a shadow on, on mountains, okay? This is some kind of a structure, and it's huge. It is huge. If that shadow is at least over a mile long. It's a long shadow. So that is the city, okay? This is why this is the most important picture. Now, I want to show you... I want to show you some LiDAR pictures of the Amazon jungle to give you an idea of how structures kind of look. It was actually these pictures of the Amazon that I looked at and it reminded me of Mars and it made me make this video. It brought me back to researching this face and the information that I already knew. I was like, well, I might as well do a video on Cydonia. I want to show you how this city goes out further all these structures continue out to the left there's many many more structures and they go farther farther down down along the way okay down along the way i'm gonna show you my next favorite picture this is like the the holy grail of cydonia it looks like even more structures continue out here to the left there's many many more structures and they go farther farther down down along the way okay this this is a far back picture and we can see the face right here we can see the squid here's the two eyes of the squid and here's the city now remember all the details in the city now imagine all these could be structures and what what's the detail that could be on, on all these structures that are kind of lined up in the same way the city was okay along the same line we can see all these what appear to be just as much as structures as the ones we just looked at okay but we don't have the detail of these other ones only on the city on the little corner that we have the detail all we have is this kind of far back view we can imagine if we had that kind of detail if we had a lidar scan of all these anomalies here all these formations let's call them formations what would they reveal but here's the biggest surprise i told you about earlier Look up here, top of the picture, to the, to the top left-hand corner. You'll see the fractures. You'll see the fractures. So what did that tell us earlier? This was an ocean. This was an ocean up here, top left-hand corner. All this was the ocean. Come down to the, to the far uh, bottom left. Where's the fractures at? There's none, okay? That means the ocean wasn't there. So what we're looking at here is a coastline. This is a coastline and see all these what they some all these bizarre shapes and all these lo looks like to me they're the same kind of shapes that are in the city. You'll see a lot of right angles in this and this stuff. Look at this one right here. This one right here is one of my favorites. This is a right angle right here. Uh, some kind of a dock looks like it to me. Uh, who knows? I'm just I'm just guessing, right? But I know that this is the ocean right here at one time. Uh, these monuments were built along the coast right does that sound familiar do we do that on earth a lot so those are my favorite pictures and that's the bombshell about Cydonia is that if it is artificial it could have been a coastal city
In 1976, NASA discovered life on Mars. They didn't think the public could handle that knowledge, so it was suppressed from us. Is it the fact that they don't think that we can handle it, we're going to go crazy, and the people are, are, are going to riot around the world? Or is it the fact that they're holding us back because they, they know that if we get our hands on some of the technologies out there and the, and the possibilities that we have, that they will lose control, they will lose their power. There's two kinds of disclosures. There's a hard disclosure and there's a soft disclosure. A hard disclosure is saying there's life on Mars in 1976, breaking it to the public. And you would grow up knowing this knowledge that there was life on other planets, not just Earth. That would be a hard disclosure. The soft disclosure is 1996, Bill Clinton got paraded out in front, of the, in front of the press saying that they found a meteor that landed in Antarctica that was from Mars that possibly contained what looked like biological life inside the rock that had been fossilized. That's the soft disclosure. The truth is, is that there is life on Mars right now. There was life on Mars, probably intelligent life. And there's archaeological ruins on Mars. What does this have to do with Earth and our history? Because there's ruins on Earth that are unexplained. We have pyramid anomalies on Mars. And we have pyramids on Earth. Could they be connected? So they still have these things, supposedly. I would guess. I mean, I don't have any information on Have you all. ever asked anyone that has any inkling of any idea of where they got them or how they got them? No, but um, something must have been said to me um, from Barry. and But I, I, it was just too long ago, and I, I can't quite remember what was said, but it... It just left a seed in my mind. I think at least one of them was part of an archaeological dig. So it's old. Something, one, at least one of them is old. I don't know if it was the one I worked on, but I remember something to do with an archaeological dig. Whoa. So that's, uh, that means it's not just old, it's ancient. Why do you say that UFOs are as real as the airplanes flying over our head? Well, because I know that they are. And they've been, um, as a matter of fact, um, they've been visiting our planet for thousands of years. During the Cold War, 1961, there were about 50 UFOs in formation flying south from Russia to the, across Europe. And the uh, Supreme Allied Commander was very concerned um, and about ready to press the panic button when they turned around and went back over the North Pole. So they decided to do an investigation, and they investigated for three years, and they decided that um, with absolute certainty that four species, four different species, at least, had been visiting this planet for thousands of years. When we look at history, and when we look at Mars, they share one thing in common, a cover-up. We see mainstream archaeology refusing to study areas like the sunken anomalies off the coast of Cuba that were discovered in 2000, the barred off tunnel systems beneath the Giza Plateau, and the mysterious ruins of Zayat El Arian which is now a dump site locked behind an Egyptian military base, running people into the mud like Graham Hancock, controlling Wikipedia, controlling things like the Anunnaki, which I proved this when I made my video on the Anunnaki. You will see a contacts banner pop up because it's likely that the bloodlines of our elites here on this planet are probably Anunnaki, descendants of the Anunnaki, kings and rulers like the Rothschilds. They come from, they come from Samaria and the Anunnaki is a word meaning from coming from the sky to earth. 
So this is why I think. So this is why I think the study of Mars and the study of ancient history are connected because we could see how both of these subjects have been suppressed and hidden from the public, trying to deny the public the truth. We see both things happening at one time here, so it makes me think that they're connected. The man who was in charge of the Israeli space program for almost 30 years, Chaim Eshed, has said in 2020, there's colonies on Mars right now. Hi, Alison. Well, this is quite a story, and it comes from the man who headed Israel's space security program for nearly 30 years. Chaim Eshed is making the extraordinary claim that the United States and Israel have been in contact with a group of aliens for years, not immigrants, but extraterrestrials. He has called them the Galactic Federation of Aliens, and he says President Trump is aware of the existence of these aliens and had been on the verge of revealing their secrets, he claims, but was asked not to do so by the Federation in order to prevent what he calls mass hysteria. Well, the retired general says the US and Israel have kept it from the public because Quotes, humanity isn't ready and the aliens don't want to reveal themselves until humanity can evolve, he says, and understand what space really is. Well, the good news is that he claims an agreement has been reached between the US government and the aliens, a contract to do experiments here. There's also, he says, a secret underground base on Mars where there are American and alien representatives. Now, this former head of a branch of Israel's defense ministry is 87. He was very well respected, at least until now. And he said all this in an interview with an Israeli newspaper in Hebrew, but it's really taken off after parts of it were published in English by the Jerusalem Post today. He says he's come forward now in the hope that his news will be accepted as true. He notes that if he'd made these claims five years ago, he would have been hospitalized. But now he says, I've got nothing to lose. Well, so far, President Trump has not tweeted about this, though remember a year ago, he did set up the Space Force as the fifth branch of the US Armed Forces. Well, we did ask the White House, the Department of Defense, and Israeli officials to comment. So far, they have not responded to the NBC News request, and I wonder if they ever will. Alison. The, the presidents of the United States have knowledge of their being colonies on Mars, a secret space program. So I'd like to end this video on this note. It's another military, secret military program, remote viewing. This man is named Joe Mick Mon Eagle, and he was assigned to give a, re a remote viewing of Mars. And this is what he saw. This might give us an idea how Mars looked and how Mars was. In May of 1984 at the Monroe Institute, uh, I had been training with Bob for almost 14 months, learning to control my out-of-body experiences. I had had spontaneous out-of-bodies for many years, and Bob had been training with me in his lab at the last year of my time at the project, Stargate project, to teach me to control my out-of-bodies. I wanted to see if controlled out-of-bodies were better at producing information, collection information, than remote viewing. It turns out you can do very specific things with out-of-bodies that you can't do with remote viewing, but it's, I don't think it's as good. If you want to know how the trigger mechanism works on a Chinese nuclear weapon, out of bodies better because you can go to the Chinese nuclear weapon and put your face in it, look around, do detailed drawing. But if you want to know where all the parts from the weapon came from, remote viewing is better because all the parts are intricately linked together data wise. So it, things are different for how you want to do things. Um, in, in any event, during that period, um, my training officer 
Skip Atwater would come in from the project and test me to see whether or not my remote viewing was getting any better. And one of his tests that he brought, one of the training tests that he brought, was a target that I didn't know anything about. I, normally I did mundane targets like quasi-military targets. Well, this particular week, he brought a Mars target. I didn't know it was a Mars target. But he gave, gave a sealed envelope, neither did Bob Monroe. He gave a sealed envelope to Bob Monroe, which inside had a card that said Mars, one million years BC. Bob thought it was another moon day target as well. And he had a uh, list of uh, coordinates. So Bob had this uh, card in his shirt pocket and we had a list of coordinates as targets. And the first set of coordinates was uh, 44.89 degrees, 9.55 degrees west. I didn't know anything about the targets as I was laying in a dark black cube in the lab floating on a sea of salt listening to hemisync tapes. And the first thing I heard was the coordinates. And this was my response. I got a great view of a pyramid, a pyramid form, sitting in a large depression. It's yellowish, ochre colored. I get clouds, a severe storm, major geological trauma. Then I was asked to visit the site before the trauma. They said, go back before the trauma. They said all the dirt had disappeared. There were now smooth walls. Everything was flat, megalithic. I said something about, gee, is this a new pyramid? Did they discover a new pyramid? Because it's really large. Shadow of people, fragments, memory of people. They said, go back to when they were there. Large people, thin and tall, wearing strange clothes, skin tight, very tight, almost can't see them. This is the actual target based on the coordinates. That's the face everybody's always referring to on Mars. This is actually the depressed area. This is the pyramid. It's actually a double layered pyramid. This is the second set of coordinates that I got. in a canyon looking up steep high walls that go on forever. Very intricate, huge sections of smooth stone carved out. Getting very large structures. Rabbit worn of huge corridors and rooms. I said the rooms were really large and again I said something to him about this has got to be some new pyramids or something because I don't remember ever seeing rooms this size in Giza or anywhere like that. That's a canyon and that's the pyramid. Now what's really interesting about this particular pyramid is you notice it's sitting on the side of the impact crater. And that's a real trick because that means the pyramid had to be put there after the impact crater. Because if the impact crater hit after the pyramid was there, it would have destroyed the pyramid. You can't have one and not the other. You understand what I'm saying? If that crater, if that crater appeared after the pyramid, it would have destroyed that pyramid. The other interesting thing about this picture is you can measure the shadow of the crater and based on the angle of the sun you can estimate the size of the crater wall as being 3,000 meters tall. So that's a pretty deep crater. Now look at the shadow on the pyramid. Pretty tall pyramid. That's a 20,000 meter tall pyramid. Pretty big, huh? That's not the only thing interesting. That pyramid had to have been formed after the crater was formed. Here's something else interesting. That pyramid's even closer to the edge. 
And here's an even more interesting fact. There's the road in, there's the road out. I just find these really remarkable pictures. Here's another, this is a general area. Pyramids huge, but different this time. The reason these were different is because they were a cluster. These are like shelters from storms. Designed for sleeping, I specified hibernation, sleeping through savage storms. I'm asked to find out why. They're an ancient people trying to survive. It's past their time and age. They're waiting for the return of someone sent to find a new home. Their world passed through the tail of a comet. I had a sense that their atmosphere was stripped away or, or destabilized when it passed through the tail of the comet. This is an old fort. Now what's interesting about the old fort, and it's something most people don't recognize, this is actually a pyramid. That's one side, that's the other side, that's the other side. The tip is missing off the top and it's hollow. I don't know if you can see that. Kind of interesting, isn't it? They call it the old fort. It's always referred to as the old fort. But that's a pyramid that's been tipped off. The tip's been taken off. Those are, that's a grouping of pyramids. And that's a building, or what's left of a building on a sort of a plateau. Or, and that's the drawing I did of the larger beings. What I think in actuality, there really are no such thing as Martians. What I think Martians are is us. I think we're descendants of the original inhabitants of Mars. And we're the ones that never went back. Give you an idea of size. That's the rough size of the Pyramid of Giza. Give you an idea of scale. Joe's talking about these enormous pyramids on Mars. If we look at the DNM Pyramid, it's miles long. Here's the DNM Pyramid. There's a face that we know that's 10 miles. There's 10 miles of separation between the, the face and the DNA pyramid. Look, look at the size of this shadow. This shadow is three miles long. Okay, it's 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 a giant shadow. So these structures on Mars in Cydonia, if they are structures, are enormous. Like like Joe McMahon Eagle says, they're enormous. And to me, I think the reason why they're so enormous is because the gravity on Mars is one-third of, of what it is on Earth. So it'd be a lot easier to build these huge structures. I'd like to end this on one, on one note. This is a picture of Earth from Mars. One of our rovers on Mars took this picture, this little blue dot in the sky. Everything that has ever been and has ever happened this has happened on that little dot. So I hope this gives you a kind of perspective. When we look back at Mars, we can feel the same way, that there was probably generations and generations of intelligent life that occupied that planet. And who knows, we may even be descendants of those folks. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.